Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 496, featuring an interview with Mr. Rusty Buchert. Uh, Rusty's a 30 plus year veteran of the games industry. He's done everything from uh, QA to, to writing, to development, to programming, to production. Worked at Sony, he's worked at Interplay, he's done a lot of stuff and he's got a, light, a lot of great stories and insights to share with us today. Uh, and I also want to say thank you uh, to Susan Manley for helping me find and uh, set up this interview. And I think a special thank you to, uh, to Rusty uh, for coming on the show even though he's got some, uh, some pretty serious medical issues that he talks about a little bit in this video. Uh, anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Rusty Buchert. Hello, folks. I am here today with Rusty Buchert. He's a 30-year veteran of the games industry with both developer and publisher experience. He shipped games from the NES to a plethora, one of my favorite words, plethora, to a plethora of games on the PC to shipping titles on the PS4 and the Switch. His titles range from the AAA to pioneering indie experiences for the PlayStation Network to pushing the limits of PSVR. He's been a senior producer at Interplay. We were just talking about you came come full circle there. Sony Computer Entertainment, White Moon Dreams, and Television. He's worked on some epic game franchises like Descent, which I happen to have a copy of right here, <laughs> and Star Trek Fleet Academy, Run Like Hell, and so much more stuff. Rusty, how are you today? Doing all right. Doing all right. Oh, thanks for doing this. You, you were just talking about how you've, you've encountered some folks who don't know their <laughs> game's history all that much. That recurring problem. Maybe we can do something to rectify that here today. Well, I do my bit because I have a stupid collection of games. You know, the ones that are great are the easy ones because it's like, okay, they did it right. The fun one is getting the games that everybody hyped up up until launch and then they suck and nobody buys it and it's like okay fine i'm buying a copy because i have to deconstruct what they did wrong you know and designers should be doing that you know because there are a lot of great ideas and you hear people talk about them and they fail and you know i had a situation where i had a designer i brought up to you before Literally, I got this idea. I want to do this. Da, 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 da. Well, are you familiar with these games? No. They all tried doing it. And they did it badly. And in different ways. So I went home, came back with all three of them. And it's like, play all three before you tell me how you're going to fix the problems. Because odds are you'll start with after playing one and run down one of the two other rabbit holes. Uh, do them all then think about it you That's know part of knowing your history because if you don't know what was tried and sounded cool and didn't work and end up chasing after the same damn thing mm -hmm. you know at least take the examples of where it didn't work save yourself some pain that's my whole thing if i can save my developers pain from my experience and knowledge i'll do that now, whether or not they listen, <laughs> that's a whole different thing. I went through that multiple times with my indie teams at Sony. You know, I gave them the warning. I see this road you're walking down on. You see something on the horizon, you know, kind of sticking up over. You're going to get close and realize, okay, it's made out of bricks. You get up real close and you'll see an indentation about head level covered in dried blood. We've all been here. I'm trying to save you the pain. <laughs> and I've had ones where they had to go down that road and bang their head on that wall because we know better than you. It's like experience talking for a moment. But that's an interesting hey. exercise to probably be pretty good advice for any indie dev to play as many of these bad games i guess you could, you could probably learn more from those than just sticking to the big hits well the big hits are always the easy stuff they got what things they did right it's the ones where it sounded like a really interesting idea and they dropped the ball you need to look at 
because you may want to do something like that in the future. And it's like, okay, I know at least not to do it this way. Yeah, I come across that a lot. We'd be looking at some of these older games, especially ones from, you know, like when they're first learning the, or when the mouse was like a new cool thing. <laughs> yeah. You got all these games where they're like, they're trying to integrate a mouse. You know, it's just looking at one, oh, what was that, Sun Dog, you know, something like that. And uh, to me, it's, it's just as somebody who likes the game history and thinking about the mechanics, it's just kind of fascinating, like the weird stuff they were trying with the interface before they, you know, like you say, got it right. You know, there's all these games where it's really wonky, but, you know, it's kind of quirky and, you know, I, uh, or the same thing with like the first person shooters, you know, there's all that stuff before the WASD standard, you know. Oh, yeah all these other paths <laughs> oh trust me i was part of that crew discovering it out we did our own thing when we did descent that was close but not quite wasd it was different well you know that was one of the more definitely one of the most successful games right the yeah i mean i could think of plenty of them <laughs> Over time, it's done eight figures in sales. So, oh, yeah, yeah, I just got my copy here. You know, back when games come in boxes, I don't know what happened to this. You know, the PlayStation, I love these sort of boxes. Like, you know, you could tell this is not just a movie or a yeah, CD. but the thing is, they shrank them for retailers to make them happy <laughs> because they tied up less self shelf space so they could put more up. Oh, well, come on. You know, as a collector, I want the, the bigger the box. Oh, the come on. You, you I got a pretty love big the old boxes on PC back in the 90s. Oh. Big box, all sorts of pack-in tchotchkes, you know, cloth maps, rune stones, whatever. And all of that, gone. Well, you need a moving truck sometimes or forklift to... <laughs> <laughs> oh god the box did you ever around. see the wing commander three was it wing commander three or four that came in a uh 16 millimeter film can oh i don't think i've got that no i would love to have full-sized that. film can with all broken up across and around inside it all for the cds see that's i love that kind of stuff does not happen anymore. Oh, there's there's the problem. Because, well, that costs money. We just want to increase margin. Sorry, came from a time before we were owned by Wall Street. You know, one of the things that happened to the industry that has really impacted things is when most of them, all the publishers really, sold their souls to Wall Street. It changed the industry. It changed the way we made product. All of a sudden, that's why we have sequel itis from hell that makes Hollywood look like amateurs. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and when do you, was there a particular, or when do you think that was the, the transition of that took place? Was it sometime in the 90s or even before that? Or? Actually, it started in the late 90s. Late 90s. That's when we actually became a very serious business to wall street and they got involved mm -hmm. and brought all the problems that come along with it. Yeah. I was thinking the, and I always think about the, in the eighties when electronic arts is kind of this example of the, of the big bad company nowadays. Right. But I remember back in the eighties when you had these advertisements and like, can a game make you cry? And you know, we see further. And it was almost like this, we're going to really sort of uplift the, the video game into this whole new, exciting, artistic and creative medium. And they were big about pushing the developer. Mm -hmm. Like rock stars. Yeah, I mean, the thing that... I mean, how many games have you never even seen of the name of the developer even? And now here's this <laughs> these photographs and everything. It was really yep. awesome. They sold their soul. <laughs> well it took a while then it i mean actually honestly where you can really see things falling in place is when annualization became a thing every year we have to release a sequel oh <laughs> and well the thing is 
it made shareholders happy, but they didn't understand what it really took to do it. Um, I'll go over on a soapbox for a moment because it's the poster child for me for this going wrong. And unfortunately, it involves EA. Medal of Honor. They had one team that had been cranking on it forever. And they decided they wanted to put that team somewhere else. And then they brought this new team in. And no problem. They'll do it annualized. Well, Medal of Honor went from an average in the 80s to the first game for them in the 70s. Okay. They're learning it. That's forgivable. Wait a minute. Next year, annualized, 60%. Next year, annualized. Overly, ridiculously, aggressively, and ambitiously. What they did to make sure they shoved it out for Christmas had an average rating of 48% and killed the franchise. Hmm. Since that's come out, there hasn't been another Medal of Honor game. And I guess these Wall Street types, they're looking for. All they care about is it has to come out for Christmas because that's when you sell the most, right? I'm right. We, this is an established franchise. People are going to buy this no matter how shoddy it is just because of the. the well, they title. don't even know if it's shoddy. They don't care. They don't, they they're not gamers. The they're ship. just people with money, right? Trying to make a. They just see widgets. They mm-hmm. don't see games. They don't see the art. You don't see the experience we're trying to take people through. They just see a widget that makes money. And fortunately, it's had a bad impact on the industry, as far as I'm concerned. It's one of the things that I like about indies is that the the sort of games, these sort of AAA games we're talking about here, the the cost to make them. Is a flashback to the early 90s. I mean, that was the thing Phil Harrison would get into about. And he didn't understand that I realized what I was doing with PSN is a future digital download, all that. And I would tell him, this is a wonderful flashback to the early 90s where it was about risk, risk uniqueness without burning the house down on costs. Because, okay, my first year... Here's the fun part. I was the only person doing development for PSN for the first year for Worldwide Studios globally because everybody else was afraid that if PSN failed, we'd look bad. It's like corporate initiative. Sony's not going to let this fail. Um, But during that time, I did Flow, Blast Factor, Flow PSP, Everyday Shooter, expansion pack for flow multiple expansion packs for blast factor and i did that all for under a million dollars you know my entire annual budget was as much what they spent for doing the demo video of what a game might be like (laughs) yeah those games are just incredible too now i was thinking you've probably done more to push the the indie well we call it art games or i don't there's different words you can use for the genre well it, it gets down to an interesting problem yeah because okay i got started on this microsoft had had a year in advance to develop xbla and they had been focusing on pop cap and arcade retro nintendo was going to make old cartridges backwards compatible okay what do we do that's different blu-ray titles are like tempo movies and johnny hardcore is gonna go out and buy them i'm doing downloadable how do i get mom dad big sister little brother and grandma playing my games you know blu-ray games are big movies PSN is television, and I want to be the Showtime, the HBO, the AMC of downloadable. And so we went in a radically different direction and tried to find magic that people would normally never, ever see. Because it's unique, different, and risky. And what I mean by risky is 
PD goes, this is cool. And marketing runs away screaming because it does, doesn't fit their check boxes. So they don't know how to sell it. I mean, I spent six months with, won't name names, but certain people in marketing at Sony trying to cancel flow because to quote them, this can't be given away for free. Nobody will take it. What? Did they actually try it? Well, what they did was when they did the, they did the typical, their lies, damn lies and statistics. Oh, they did their own focus group for the <sighs> audience that I was 100% not targeting. Okay. You put a bunch of FPS and street fighter kids in front of flow. Odds are they're not going to like it. Well, that's not my target audience. Let me see. I got the website I can pull up here and we can take a look. Same thing happened with Flower. I mean, this this flow game. I mean, I don't know who could look at this and just not be. I mean, at the very least, intrigued by this. I mean, I remember going to academic conferences, and if there was any kind of a game studies sort of situation there, they'd be talking about this. You know, it was much, I would say the audience was much more was much broader i mean just <laughs> who doesn't <laughs> who can't appreciate this i just would blow my mind He's... well it's one of those things that i always considered i've seen this nope. described as like therapy almost you know people that play this it's 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 kind of the way this i tried to experience. describe it was yeah. it's zen pac-man for the 21st century Okay, Zen Pac-Man for the 21st century. I love that. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> because it's about eat or be eaten, grow, evolve, or die, and it mellows you out. It is kind of a psychedelic vibe to it. Yeah, I, mean, I just well, love it myself. I'm, I, it doesn't surprise me, though, to hear that <laughs> There were folks that, that, I mean, if they're if they're comparing it to, I guess, what, Call of Duty or something, okay. It's the wrong audience. It wasn't the target audience. I mean, one of my favorite letters we ever got was from a grandmother. And the whole thing was, got together with the family for Christmas, saw the kids, grandkids playing a game. And it was like, this is interesting. Can I play it? Mm -hmm. And the grandkids are like, really? Sat down, played it, loved it, went home, bought a $300 console for a $10 game, and that was Flower. I've done my job. I'm selling consoles to grandma. Let's see if we can get Flower up here, too. That's another one that's just... To me, this is another one of those just wow. Yeah, poetry in motion. That's a good description of this. Just beautiful. And it's a very different experience to anything else people have played in games. Yeah, you really couldn't get more different. I've seen some of your other interviews where you're talking about this and just the, you know, there's so many, there's so much focus, and, you know, especially non-gamers when they, they think about games and the games industry, they're always talking about these, it's usually going to be something about hyper-violence and, you know, something really destructive and, and they just totally ignore that there's this other, <laughs> well, this the whole thing other is dimension they could be exploring problem is all the hyper violent games get all the marketing dollars they're advertised everywhere these things outside of pr coverage didn't really have any marketing i did it all on pr and interviews to get people aware about it well i certainly heard about it through you know a lot of the uh, i guess game critics you know, they, they were raving yeah. about it in the, the magazines. And like I say, we had academics talking about it. I don't know if you ever, you ever meet Ian Bogost. Yeah. 
Yeah, I remember reading. He talks a lot about these games in his books. Yeah, I thought yeah. you you could described uh, at one point. I forget where I pulled this this quote. This was back in 2007, and you were talking about people. You used, actually used the word indoctrinated. So people get indoctrinated into the general way of thinking about games and genre design execution. First, I think that's spot on. <laughs> but then you're talking about how you wanted to go uh, and create a Sundance channel. You know, basically do, I guess, for, for the video games, what the Sundance Film Festival does for film, which wow well, the thing is to bring out the indies my thing has been and i'll still stick by it that the next miyamoto the next war inspector the next sid meyer is going to come from the indie scene it isn't going to come from the big boys because you're a cog in the machine and you've got all these bright ideas like no it's incremental evolutionary at best not revolutionary not risky lather rinse repeat with the same iteration of the game over and over again and 10 years from now we'll think about letting you do something and it's been beaten out of them mm. um and the big yeah, committee is cynical but it's Yes, I'm bagging on my own industry, but when is the last time you saw something really revolutionary come out of any of the big players? Hmm. I don't, have we ever? <laughs> the last one that I mean, really they sticks buy, in my they might head. might find an indie project somewhere and put their name on it, I guess. And... Katamari Demacy. Well, okay. That's a good I still would have loved to be in the pitch session for that because how do you sell the execs on basically a dung beetle simulator? A dung beetle simulator. <laughs> you, well, come on, look at Katamari and that's basically what it is. Yeah, that game, what was that? Was that early 2000s or earlier? Yeah. Than it somewhere. was 2000s. It was PS2. I th yeah, Su uh, Monkey Ball was pretty pretty fun i don't know if you'd put it in the, in the same yeah but the katamari oh, yeah. game yeah that's another one where you know you talked about grandma walking by and being like well hey what's that that looks like fun <laughs> it's just kind of got that uh almost intrinsic appeal it's not just sort of this latest iteration of this thing that's you know, up to number 16 in a franchise it was something seriously whimsical and unique yeah it's whimsical kind of bizarre <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i was going to ask you that like you know you've put out some you've been responsible for putting out some of these really original games we're still talking we're still using them as examples you know do you what do you think besides have there been what what sort of sticks out on your radar in the past few years that you think is really bold and sort of makes a statement well the thing is I only recently started having my publisher hat on during my short tenure at Intellivision. And the two things that got my attention at the time that they really didn't have publishing plans in place were Kiwi and Chicory. Those were two where I'm like, okay, there's some magic in there just looking at this that I think would take with people. I mean, Kiwi turned out okay. Chicory turned out well. Um, and right now I'm just getting my feet back under me because I went back to full time doing it yet again, beginning in September. So I haven't really dug in back to the indie scene recently and I need to because that's where something special is going to be found. A colorful tale. This one looks, I have it. I'm not familiar with this one. Steam game festivals. 
Well, that is pretty cool. You know, is that maybe we should back up a little bit and you know talk about how you got started in the in the games industry. I mean, you've got quite a quite the resume, quite a, a lot of titles. I'm sure people. Let me just show this for a second. <laughs> sure, a lot of people will recognize some of these games. You know, you must have done some games with Peter Oliphant. You know, I had him on the show not too long ago. It's probably been like a decade ago. <laughs> and we were looking at Lexi Cross and, uh, uh, of course, Stone Keep. I think that must have been early 90s. What was your first? Uh... My first project was yeah, Lord yeah. of the Rings Volume 1. I think this is going to be Volume 2 here. Yep. Which you worked on the first one too. And yeah. That one did some nightmarish things for its time on volume two. Um, volume one is interesting because I was QA department of one, but I was also kind of AP to the producer designer. I also was a scripter. I did, God help me, the CGA graphics conversions. It was kind <laughs> of a, I, I did a CGA. little bit of everything. Oh, they probably don't have the CGA graphics here. Oh, uh, no. That was our first VGA title. So if you're going to see anything, it's all going to be focusing on VGA. So what did the CGA version look like? Oh, Problem was, I had done the conversion in cyan, magenta, white, and black. Because that's cool to the eye. But I was told I had to redo it in red, yellow, green, black. <laughs> I wish they, I could find the CGA version. I can't find an example. It's brutal. It is brutal. Because you remember what yellow and green and red were for CGA. They were kind of bright. Yeah, it wasn't the best color palette for games. I don't, I don't hear too many people waxing nostalgic about the glorious CGA. <laughs> yeah, but I think, you know, the thing is, no graphics. Well, the thing is, people did some good stuff with the cyan magenta palette. Mm -hmm. They did a lot of things playing around with negative space and everything else. That actually looked pretty damn good. Um, but you had to think about it hard. Um, but yeah. But on the you so for the volume two though, you had a, a different role. Let's see, I lost my page here. <laughs> what were you doing on part two? Let's see. I don't have you checked the uh your uh, Moby Games page. Sometimes people tell me these things are inaccurate. Just says mine has not been good. I have brought up things multiple times. And I've been told I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's oh. my goddamn game. Oh, no, it isn't. Hell? Yes, it is. They're arguing with the person. They're arguing with you about it. Okay. Yeah. That's so crazy. I just gave up trying to correct anything. So what should it say here for volume two? Well, I was the, at that point, I was, I grew the QA department at Interplay because it's like, okay, guys, you're filing four projects at once. There is one of me. It's got you here as associate producer. Yeah. And if you get way down there, it should also have director of QA somewhere. No. Yes. Oh, Christ. They didn't include me on that. All right. And it says play testers of Middle Earth. Yeah. Well, the thing is, they covered the lead I put on the project at the tail end. Um, oh, also design assistance. As I said, I've worn many hats. You know, I've always been curious. How does this? Is there a lot of discussion at some point? And they're like, well, here's how you'll be credited. Here's how we're going to 
credit you. I mean, is that a discussion that takes place or is this just, just shows up later and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> well, I mean, a lot of it has changed. Uh, people don't wear many hats anymore in the industry. They do one thing. So it doesn't get creative. Um, I mean, back then there was some discussion because it's like, okay, Lexacross. Yes, I ran test on it. Yes, oh. I did the uh, ad lib and sound blaster and PC speaker music uh, rearrangement for the fat man because it was stuff that would not work. Um, I also that? wrote 700 of the puzzles for Alexa cross. You mind if I show the cover? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> it's good. I don't think this would make it today. It was a synthetic game show designed by Peter. Oh, fun. Oh, he got his, he's right on the cover of the box. Yep. So you did all the puzzles for this, right? Or most? I, I did a good chunk of them. I did about Let's three see, there quarters. Must be screenshots here. This must have been fun to work on. Yep. It was kind of like Wheel of Fortune and Scrabble. Um, we got actually sued by the Wheel of Fortune. Really? Oh, uh, Vana felt Robana violated. Oh. <laughs> Did that turn out okay? I guess not. Oh, yeah, it's about man. I just know it got resolved. Oh, that's good. Ivana, Robana. <laughs> it looks like a fun game to me. I kind of want, wanted to boot it up. Do you still remember all the answers? It would probably take me a little bit to jar my brain on, oh, yeah, this is this. I mean, the ridiculous ones on the ultra high difficulty, I'll probably have a hard time remembering. I forgot what we were talking about with Lexicross. <laughs> I just well, just, I've done a lot of stuff, um, which made it interesting before I became management. Oh, yeah. Just I the, can the, actually the, say I have may not have gotten credits but i've put code in games everything else you know even the scripting in lord of the rings was pretty much pascal was what it was based off of it's like oh i know pascal and lead program is like really you're qa it's like dude i've been programming before you i started programming back in 77 so don't give me guff I don't have a degree, but I, I think that's a good way to work. You know, the, the you get more. Uh, I forget who I was talking to. I've talked to people before, and they don't like these uh, the way things got wherever it's so segmented and siloed. You know, it was better when you had more like the oh well, artists contrib contribute, collaborate with the, the music folks, and you know, it's kind well, of this it's... collective thing. Might be harder, I guess, later to say, well, who come up with this? We don't even remember anymore. You know, I guess from that perspective, it might be tough, but yeah. But the thing is, the isolation means you don't understand the other crafts, and it makes it harder to communicate. Um, that's one thing I kind of pride myself on that I can at least kind of be a bridge ground. I may not be up to date on programming, but I can understand the limitations and then translate it over into artist and go, you can't do these things because X, Y, and Z, this doesn't work anymore. Well, what do you want? Okay. This is what they're trying to get. What can we do? You can get a compromise. But the thing is you don't have as many people who actually can talk the different languages fluently to make it easier to get games made at times. And by isolating the different crafts, a lot of them don't really know how to put it so somebody else can understand. Yeah, I was thinking about the some of the work you've done with uh, 
I don't know. We're kind of jumping around here. That's all right. <laughs> but the, uh, you know, I was thinking of that linger in shadows. You know, that was really intriguing. The because it does kind of show what what sort of the possibilities when these different fields, if you will, collaborate, and you have, uh, you know, it's it's hard to compare it to something, right? It's just kind of the well. The thing it was, it is, it's this, but like game audio is is kind of one of my things I like a lot. But it gets like so so often, you know. I've talked to George the Fat Man. You know, we mentioned him. Yeah. Talked to him about this too, and he's just like, you know, this it's just like an afterthought. You know, a lot of these games, the whole audio. Oh, component. trust me, that has made for interesting problems because I'm actually an advocate for the audio department. Okay. Because <laughs> uh, I have worked audio in seven projects. And you actually played a troll, I noticed in uh oh yeah. Stone that was <laughs> but like okay, you saw War Machine Tactics as one of my games. Yeah. I did 70% of the audio for it because we lost our freelance sound designer to health emergency. Hmm. And okay, we couldn't find anybody else that could do it at that range, and it was like okay, guys, I can do this. I'm slow, but you'll have good results. And I did that mainly with the god-awful Hollywood 6000, the old Hollywood 6000 sound library. Okay. It was me taking and torturing elements together <laughs> to make what, I, I mean, I think I did a damn good job with what I was working with. Um, But so, yeah, I believe in trying to give audio time. It's not, oh, they just throw it together at last month. No, you don't understand what it takes to create the elements to combine together to make one sound. You know, it's not that easy. At times, it's going through your search through for finding just the right name for the right sound that's close to what you want. And then you got to get the four other elements to put together and lay out in time and put against each other and then render out as one sound file. And now do this for a couple hundred different sounds. It takes I've time been there. I, I've been there even with my own sort of hobby game projects. So you want a magic spell, want a fireball. Okay. Download this sound pack. <laughs> now I need to go through like 10,000 different, you know, sounds. And I'll do it. You know, I'm like, okay, that's not quite right. <laughs> or maybe if I combine Hours these two of... together, I don't sound like everybody else's explosion that's out there now. Right, exactly. But I mean, if you get it right, it like, okay, that it's like those subtle things that most gamers probably don't even really probably doesn't even register. But you know, they they just they'll just say there's something about this that I really enjoy and it brings me back. And it might very well be the sounds. Sounds are much more important than people realize. Uh, a phrase I came up with that sound and music hijacked and they just re replaced either sound or music into it. But basically my thing was sound makes the game play better and people don't realize it. And best way of getting how much of a psychological effect it has you let them play the game before sound is in period mm -hmm. and then let them pay, play the exact same thing with all the audio in. and the excitement level changes a lot and you know, then they realize no this is important it's like yeah it is and you need to give them time to do it right you don't throw it in in the last couple months, sound will do their thing. And it's like, literally, you are condemning people to crunch because you put it off. And that's not cool. Yeah, I remember speaking of the psych or the, uh, the psychological elements to this. And I really love, love talking to the fat man. <laughs> that was, he's a great guy. But, you know, he was talking about these, uh, he'd, he'd moved on to working on these, um, uh, what do you call them slot machines for like vegas yeah las vegas shows but you know he's like we it took him forever to make these 
because he wanted all the uh like the six there'd be like six or seven of these machines side by side in the casino i guess and he wanted them to like be able to listen to each other and like play almost like an orchestra of, of sound i can see that like, that is incredible like who thinks like that i mean of course you, you know somebody a musician would think the like fat that. man <laughs> I mean, he always thought outside the box i love whenever i've had time to hang out with george so let's see we, we were talking about you you started with lexi cross and lord of the rings and you know i got a lot of interest in there's some questions about your work on the bard's tell construction set this was one of your early ones right you did the i think a scenario yeah. for it yep you know i think this is a brilliant project you know everybody's played these, these games but this was really cool to be able to make and this was you know i guess it was and one thing I might ask you about is how did people share the scenarios they, they created with this? Because you really didn't have a, an internet, obviously. Or... Well, back then it was sneaker net. Sneaker net. <laughs> sneaker net. Oh, sneaker net. You know, give your buddy a floppy. Hey, check this out. And yeah, there's quite a few. We have those big boxes of... Uh floppy disks back then with the handwritten labels on them but this is you know what did you think of this do you think it was a well done uh we did a lot i enjoyed it it just didn't resonate with the public at the time I which was why. The concept of CPS, create, play, share, just wasn't a thing until about four years later. Between Doom and Descent, all of a sudden, people were creating and sharing levels with each other. I think the internet helped mm -hmm. make it more of a thing because it was easier to share. But it was at that time because, you know, there were thousands of levels made for Doom. There were thousands of levels made for Descent. And they were all shared. Just not the right time, unfortunately. A little too I hard. mean, I put a hell of a lot of work into that because the, the level design I did deliberately actually did some funky things taking advantage and abusing the map editor so if somebody was drawing out maps for each level they put it on top of each other they realized thargwillian's tower was like huh they're like stacked like this and then you know another one off this way and over that way and it's like yeah it was like some nightmare from Rube Goldberg is the best way of putting it. Um, but yeah, it just didn't resonate at the time. It was a little bit ahead of its time. When you were making your scenario, did they, did you have like the finished product to work with and you make the scenario? Or was it more like you're kind of giving feedback to the crew and like, well, we okay, were was... still working on the project while we were doing that i mean many a time would find wonky bugs because somebody would do something really different building level like okay we got something to fix go back albeit we had issues very early on and discovered the hard way that the lead programmer was colorblind because he did certain things with the ui and it was like, why are we using screaming pink and yellow, neon yellow on top of each other? It's, like, it's a good contrast. I, Dude, are you colorblind? Uh, yeah. Okay, you don't get to make art decisions. I'm just thinking through that. <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> 
Okay, well, let's see what else we got here. I know we have, people probably at least want us to jump into the Starfleet Academy and, and Descent, but I did get a question about Buzz Aldrin. Okay. Race into space. And he says he was really, he really loved how it was loaded with historic video clips and other historically correct items. He, he really liked those and he wanted to know if you had got to meet Buzz. Was he part of the, was he involved in the? Um, the I got development? to meet Buzz. He really wasn't, wasn't involved. I'll be honest, it was branding because people are aware who Buzz was. Um, it was based off of a tabletop game. Hmm. And it was a really good tabletop game. And they came up with the idea of we want to make a computer game out of it because it removed a lot of the bookkeeping, click bookkeeping you had to do in the tabletop, computer took care of. It wasn't you. Um, I wasn't aware that so there was a tabletop game. Was that a pop? Was it a popular tabletop game? Um, yeah, board game for its time, it was. Um, and a lot of screenshots here. I mean, we had a huge library of film footage. We also had some film footage. I really can't go into details that we could not use from Russia. Um, oh, top secret stuff. Uh, it's stuff they don't want to admit to. I thought and you meant like, uh, what do they call them now? UAP. <laughs> UAP. It had to do with a very catastrophic accident at Balkanor. Oh. Yeah, and I didn't play this one back. I have to admit, I'm I'm intrigued by it. But and it was interesting because back then we had it set up so you could play it over modem, or you could do it even play by mail. Oh, play by mail! I haven't thought about that in a while. Speaking of, <laughs> she called it sneaker <laughs> sneaker net. So that would take some time. Or pl- I should say, play by email. We but... had a. I remember Empire was like that. We had to mail the discs, take a turn, save it, mail it, <laughs> wait, get it back. I mean, okay. We well, signed it there. Well, let's jump into the Starfleet game then. Got a lot of. Uh, a lot of, you know, I, I posted about, you know, I'm interviewing Rusty and here's his, you know, here's the games he's worked on. And of course it was like Star Star Trek, Star Trek. <laughs> Get him to talk about any, any stories about this, please. You know, uh, so that, I, that, I just that, turn it over to you. Yeah. What, what, what was this? What was it like working on this? Um, It was pretty cool overall. I mean, I got to work with the entire crew of the original series. How awesome is that? It was fun. You know, um, some things great, some things not so great. Uh, The most infinite, infamous thing. Did you ever listen to Howard Stern? Yeah, I've listened to him off and on. Okay, in the 90s you remember the whole thing about the recording session and bill shatner (sighs) you say tomato i say tomato you say sabotage i say sabotage blah 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 and later on don't tell me how to read my lines it sickens me yeah that was me (laughs) and learning about that being released driving into work being broadcast nationwide yeah, that was not fun. Because, you know, the real trick was uh, a certain member of the cast did not read the scripts until day of, period. He had the script for 30 days. And we could not read lines in. He would just read it his way. And... It's like, no, your character's getting angry. You know, this is, you know, three selections. Good, bad, meh. 
You're on the bad line. You're being not your character normal self. Well, no, 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 no. And we had done 18 takes. <laughs> Punch it up. Yeah. There's some hum on the line. Somebody slammed a door. One time for coverage. Oh, you have some syllabus there. Take a drink of water. And I just kind of got fed up and told the VO director to read it back to him the way we wanted it. And he blew up. And the worst part was his contract was ugly. If he got angry for other, any reason, he could walk away. And then you could have him back, finish it tomorrow. It could be two lines and it'd be a full day's fee. Ah. And his full day's fee involved five figures. Wow. So when that happened in the VO booth, I'm freaking out going, oh shit, I'm going to get fired if this happens. I go home two days later, I'm driving into work and I hear the same damn thing on Howard Stern. Oh God, I'm fired. Um, but yeah. But everything else in between, the cast was great to work with. You know, DeForest Kelly, even though he was fragile was the only way I can put it when he was coming in, but he was sharp. Um, the outtakes we got out of him where he would just do it off the cuff, you know, had him doing some color lines and he just make one up on the fly and present it. And it was like, you should be careful if he wants to show you what he calls the captain's log. <laughs> Now imagine that in Bones' voice. Yeah, I miss him. Um, so it sounds like it was kind of a mix of joy and, and pain. For the most part, it was joy. You know, it's one of those things where the relationship got better with that talent when we actually did Starfleet Academy because they were killing him off. And it went from, you need me, to I kind of need you now. It's like, yeah. Um, so. I mean, I assume you're, you were a big Star Trek fan before this. Oh yeah. I grew up with Star Trek and the simple fact I get, got to meet the entire cast. I got to meet Gene. Um, I had Gene back me up on some arguments with licensing that, no, this is Star Trek. That is not what you're saying. Um, actually, the biggest thing that happened for me, because it was telling me, okay, I've been, I'm doing this right, is after Gene had passed, quite a ways later, Majel called me. And offered me the rights to uh, Earth Final Conflict because she liked what I had been doing with Star Trek. And that's just one of those. Okay, the TV show's not even close to being out. I'm beginning, you know, A, just the fact that she trusts me with it was like, holy crap. And on top of it, compared to dealing with most of Hollywood, she was giving me access early enough to do it right. Um, I mean, in turn, getting back to Buzz Aldrin's race in the space, because I did that, I was contacted about doing Apollo 13, the game, for the movie. Mm -hmm. Cool. Eight months before it came out. <laughs> it's like, uh, I need time to do this right? That game took 18 months. No, I'm passing. Yes, I know it's film made by blah, 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 but I'm not going to cram out a piece of crap just to make your date. Sorry. <clears throat> and then people wonder why so many games based on movies are, you know, seldom as good as the movie. And it's just that that time, <laughs> and just not having. If the game developer had, had a couple of years, you know, or even sometimes a couple more months, even. Well, the thing is, get us involved early. 
you know, that was the problem. Oh no, the movie's done. Now we'll get you involved. No, get us involved at the beginning because we can make some really cool stuff. You yeah, chop was, that time off, you get what you pay for. I think it was David Crane that I talked to about this, and he's talking about the Ghostbusters game way back. You know that one? The yeah, <laughs> on the C64. Yeah, he's like, I didn't even get the. He said, not only did I not see the movie, you know, or get any of the script, or he got nothing. I think he got like a picture of the car. Oh wow. <laughs> it's like if you ever wonder why the game is it's not quite like the movie <laughs> they gave me nothing sorry nothing that's like well it's still a fun game you know but yeah well that's way back when hollywood really thought we were a joke mm. whether or not we like it they thought we were a joke we weren't going to be sticking around that long it's a fad honestly it's a fad they're not going to compete with us. Yeah, guess what, guys? We're still here. <laughs> We're actually making much more bigger money. box office than you are. Yeah, it's kind of sad. Now it's almost like nobody wants to go, or they're having a struggle with the like getting people into the theater. You know, to see even a big, you know, big budget movie. Who would ever would have thought back then? You know, there would be the. I guess more demand for the game than, than the movie. You know, you'd really have to have a lot of foresight, I guess, to envision that. Yeah. Well, part of the problem is movies keep remaking themselves. My God, help me. How many times are we going to remake? Rusty, you're this not movie? a big fan of sequels, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I no, it's not even sequels. It's the same movie remade. I agree. I'm and I'm it's one of those okay, two, eight, three, yeah. four times. <laughs> and for everyone that's really good, there are five that are really bad. Um, and it's frustrating. It's a lack of creativity. Mm -hmm. And I see Hollywood getting really run over with it, and. You know, people are going to hate me for this, but our industry is being run over with this. You know, that's why I got a problem with sequelitis is there's a lack of real creativity going on. I'm doing this because it's safe. I'm doing this because they can sell it. It's like, don't you have any unique experiences you really want to take people through? And it's like, I mean, come on. That was my whole thing with pushing indie at Sony, taking people through unique experiences they wouldn't see anywhere else. And that's something we can do as an industry, and we choose not to. <clears throat> you know, and just it, hearing that the like the book industry, I heard a statistic on one of these news programs, and it was some absurd statistic, like only 10% of books make a profit. And only like a maybe like four percent, very tiny sliver are big enough hits to you know fund all this other stuff. But I mean, the point is you have to have that, you know, because one of like one of those authors in the pile somewhere down wide, way down at the bottom of the tail might be the next, you know, Stephen King or, or who knows, right? Yeah, you know, they have to have that chance. And, you know, with a movie, I guess it would be a lot harder or. I mean, especially a big budget game, and maybe maybe that'd be the worst. Where even if somebody had a really brilliant idea and the talent, you know, they had everything they needed. <laughs> uh, just getting that okay, you know, getting through all those those gates. To, well, to the thing it, is, getting having, attention on it, having the right advocate inside the publisher means everything. You know, somebody who really is willing to fight for the project. And that's the hard one because nobody wants to stretch their neck out to take the risk because they'll look bad if it falls apart. Hence, see the nobody, ever, nobody ever got fired for buying IBM or <laughs> some, some phrase like that. Yeah. <laughs> It's just one of those things that I'll be honest, I have prided myself on a lot of my titles 
sticking my head out to make them happen. Because that's where the magic for people is going to come from. You got to take some risk. And the lack of risk in our industry is bad for it. I mean, I look at some of the risks you, you've taken with some of the games you published, and that you know, it seems like you've been really successful, really good at picking. You know, I've, been titles. I've known plenty. It. I've had other. I've had plenty of uh, you know producers on, and they you know they back some stinkers. <laughs> you know, the thing is, and I'm not being arrogant for a moment. Please do not take it being arrogant. I've just had a really good nose for talent. I found Bar- Parallax. I mm-hmm. found BioWare. I found Triarch. I found Bluepoint. That's my most recent one. I found them when they were a two man team. You know, I have done this for decades now. Well, what, what is it that sort of tips you off? What are your, what do you look for? I mean, is there a certain tell? Is there a, <laughs> just a feeling? It's, it's uh, I mean, people, it's seeing, even with their early on prototypes, it's like, okay, they're thinking different. This is cool. I mean, when I saw what became Descent was all grayscale textures. It only moved forwards. You wow. It only moved forwards. It behaved like an arcade game. I had to fight to get save games in it. I bet two paychecks with Matt and Mike over the demo release that they were going to, in 48 hours, put in creep and save. Just watch Usenet. They called me 24 hours later and I won. But, I mean, I saw what the game could be. Little love, little direction. It could be magical. Same thing with Bioware, same thing with Triarch, same thing with that game company, same thing with what the guys pulled off for me for launching PSN at Bluepoint. Um, I mean, here's a kicker. The guys that did uh, Lingering Shadows, mm-hmm. uh, Michael, leading the team is now one of the high muckety muckets mucks at epic poland i mean kid's brilliant and when i found him he was wasting his talent as a php programmer <laughs> wow and if you take a look he did that they did that torah they did bound and he was wasting away doing web programming I, mean, I love these stories of, you know, it, it, I remember reading the, about Pac-Man and they, they had, when they tried to bring Pac-Man over here, I think it was Puck-Man or something like that at the time. Yes, and they None of the, it they're like, this is going to suck. You know, it's, this is not going to be any fun. We, you know, we'll take the Rally X, <laughs> you know, it's a bit like you say, somebody had to fight like, no, this is the, this will this be is the magic, magic, you know, come on. <laughs> Go on, I just, I mean, but like, wow, Descent, I, I, I want to hear like, so the people that were arguing against you, like, okay, we this, this Descent game, no. I actually didn't have as much trouble. The only place where I really had trouble with it was going out shareware. Mm-hmm. My sales department thought I was insane because that was going to kill sales. It's like, okay, I can't, we didn't have videos back then. In Descent, you couldn't explain in screenshots. That's that's a good point. So I had to get a demo in people's hands. And that demo sold a crap ton of Descents. It got people hooked. But seriously, the sales department thought, Myself and the guy from marketing who was working with me, we were out of our minds to want to do shareware. They thought it wouldn't work. They didn't believe the numbers they heard on Doom by doing shareware. That can't be true. Yeah, no. 
<laughs> I was on Twitter a while earlier today and I was uh post you know I was talking about descent. I found this old TV commercial. I guess it was a TV oh, commercial. Oh god. And it was like descent is greater than doom <laughs> because it's got you know the uh, more movement 3D and, and, yeah. and oh god, god yeah. yeah. It's not like you're familiar with the commercial. I mean <laughs> was that yeah, like I was like on set when they were all shot and I cringed many times on the lines our marketing people wanted to push. My favorite one is you know the hand that would jump out moving the mouse did you recognize the mouse? There's a real problem with it. Hmm. It was a Mac mouse <laughs> on a PC game. And I was told to be quiet. I was being too annoying. <laughs> yeah, that would have bothered me if I if I had seen that. Well, I, the one I was like, it's kind of muddy the graphics i just thought it was funny i was wondering if was there like a was it, did it get heated like this id and not really guys i mean i don't know if you you, you ever the, meet romero and carmack and... i have met john romero a few times um not really met the carmack actually the only time i had anything heated about descent was Chris Roberts and Richard Garriott. Matt, Mike, and myself were walking across the parking lot at GDC. And Chris is coming across the parking lot with Richard. And, okay, excuse my French, because I am going to be Chris for a moment. God damn it, you sons of bitches, it's your fucking fault. And we're like, what the hell? It's your fault. We're going to be late, and it's all your. And he finally gets up close and breaks out laughing. Uh, it turns out Roger Garriott bought legitimate copies of Descent for the entire team for Wing Four. Because <laughs> seven o'clock, everything shut down, and servers went up, and that was that. And there was a delay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'm delaying other people's games. I think that's kind of good. You know, it's like I've I've got P, you know, I got PD going, no, you're right. This is a good game. So he's got a theme of delays, I guess. <laughs> well, I've heard the yeah, you know, the parallax theory. You know, t- tell me a little bit more about Bioware. Um I met Greg and Roy way back. And this was for what became eventually Shattered Steel. Mm -hmm. And in between, while we were talking about all that, I saw actually, I liked the concept and the like they were way they were thinking. Um, That's part of both. Okay, it's Mech Warrior for the masses. What they were making with the game, Hmm. it was an easier version of Mech Warrior. And I saw their work in progress. Five Deadly Venoms RPG. Are you familiar with Five Deadly Venoms? Five Deadly Venoms? It's a Hong Kong Kung Fu Shaw Brothers film. Hmm. They were doing a Hong Kong Kung Fu RPG. It's not like Jade Empire. Yeah, kind of the predecessor to that. Many, many years before. But it was just the way they were thinking. It's like, okay, how do we bring a different experience? It's not yet another RPG. And not the, I'm the chosen one. I'm the chosen, chosen one. I'm the chosen, (laughs) chosen one. As I progress in power and never have anything wrong happen. Um, And that was part of like, okay, let's get this. And then eventually after they did Shattered Steel, they got involved doing the D&D projects. Which did phenomenally well. Oh, yeah. Those are some of the best. Some of my favorite games ever. Yeah, here's Shattered Steel. Mech Warrior for the masses. Much simpler controls. I got to say, I, we used to play that Mech Warrior series. We had a computer lab at college, and we had, we'd sneak in after it closed and play... <laughs> 
is some epic. <laughs> oh, you gotta understand. I I was fortunate enough to have one of the battle tech centers near me. Ooh. Um and I was turned out to be really good at it. Um problem is I got to learn a lot from the world champion. He used to come up to our center instead of the one that was near him in San Diego and spent a lot of time hanging out with him and a couple other guys that are like, okay. My biggest problem was getting a master's qualification. You had to take on two masters, or I should say you had one master, two masters to start with that you were fighting. And then after so much time, a third one dropped in. But I had Hunter, who was the world champion four times in a row. Um, Another member of the national team and another person who had over 10,000 missions under his belt, all wanting to be my guys to deal with in the Masters. Like, yeah, no, this isn't worth the pain. The three of you ganging up on me? Ah, no, not doing it. I'll hang out. I'll play with you guys, but I'm not going to get that master qualification because no, don't need like a black belt test for karate or something. Yeah. It's a black belt test with three, uh, 10th Don guys going, okay, no problem. You're going to take us on. Yeah. Right. And I wish I could have gone to the battle tech center. That sounds amazing. Well, you had that and Martian football. Um, both were interesting. It's a shame that they went under because mm. they actually did some really neat stuff. Let's see. What do we got? Treyarch. So people were thinking those, those guys, these, they're never going to make it. Right? <laughs> well, we were, oh, man. I was one of the advocates for die by the sword. Let's see if I can get that pulled up here. That's Triarch in the Wayback Machine. 1998. It's arena mode tournament. Well, the thing is, that doesn't do it justice. Because one of the unique things with actual combat is there was a mode that you could play it where... The mouse was part of an IK chain on the arm. Hmm. So doing third person over the shoulder, you were literally kind of fancy and fighting that way. I should have I should have done a shareware demo. Did they do a shareware? I don't remember if they did. But it had some neat stuff. Again, thinking outside the box. Mm-hmm. And it's just awesome. The three huge studios. And you were the, I guess, maybe like the only one who's like, these are the, <laughs> come on. <laughs> this is really cool what these guys are doing. I want to pick your brain a little bit about VR because I know you had done some a lot of cool, like really early stuff. I was reading about some of these headsets. I had to look them up. Uh, the VFX one. Yeah, the VFX four, which was the best okay. one in the mid nineties thousand dollars it's like seven so this would be almost two thousand bucks basically let's just call it 2k and then there was a virtual eyeglasses i letter i yeah <laughs> glasses and then i think my favorite is the hasbro toaster. oh the toaster project that never saw the light of day you know, what I, had I, dis- just, yeah. I had descent running at 60 frames a second on that damn thing. 60 frames a second on this thing. No, the hardware was amazing. The GPU, the way they had it set up and designed. 
problem was Hasbro management didn't get that you didn't go after high profit on the hardware. It's a razor blades business. That's where you make the money. And looking at actually losing money on hardware freaked them out. That's an interesting looking headset. <laughs> that was early stages. Yeah, this I was just talking to Jay Barnes and Rampant Coyote. He's been doing some, he's really interested in this this space. And yeah, you know, we've been talking about like you know, people know about the Oculus Rift and all this stuff, but like all of this, all of this 90s explosion of VR. Like what what happened? Why didn't it expensive as hell expensive as hell and at that time because the patent was tied up with a military uh contractor we couldn't do 64480 we were trapped in 320 by 200 320 by 240 because the blue pixel at 640 by 480 was locked up in a patent i didn't know that so there was some kind of patent issue with this and it was a patent issue with a military contractor. Oh, so they're like using the, I guess that, yeah, they'd probably be using it for some kind of war simulation. Huh. How was it like they uh, don't want to, it's a kind of a confidentiality type thing or is it just. A, I don't know, but much know beyond. Wouldn't want you guys I actually had one of the hardware manufacturers kind of like, guys, I know you can do this. Why don't you have the higher resolution? It's like, yeah, oh, this is why. Okay, I can appreciate that. Being an IBM brat whose dad worked for their federal systems division, I get it. Um, but yeah. But no, VR was just too damn expensive, honestly. And the technology that was driving it at that time had really big problems with latency. And more importantly, depending on the structure you were in, the motion control got wonky because they were working off of earth magnetic and slicing through the field. Anything disturbed the field screwed up how you were moving, which tended to make people more motion sick. Yeah. I mean, here's a good way of looking at it. I did descent. I learned a lot with that. And even with doing that, we had a 30 to 40% negative reaction rate. How high was that? 30? Yes. Because the frame rate wasn't that high. Now I can fast forward to PSVR. Mm -hmm. I had over triple the frame rate. I had significantly lower latency on uh, motion tracking. Those two things combined together made a huge difference. And applying some of the lessons that I learned back in the 90s that I kept trying to tell people they needed to think this way because everybody was thinking inner ear, eyes, inner ear, eyes. That's everything for motion sick. That's not the case. You have a huge neural network expecting feedback from what it's seeing visually. You get slammed around. I should feel something with my shoulders hitting into these pads, right? Nothing. I got slammed in the head and it snapped back. I feel nothing. It's a bunch of divide by zero errors in the brain hmm. that stack up. And different people have different tolerance levels. But if you do things that are triggering the body expecting responses and it doesn't get them, it stacks them up. And eventually it gets to the, I must be poisoned. Oh. And that's why you puke because oh. it's purging because, okay, no, the nervous system, you know, and the normal checks are okay, but I'm not feeling anything. Something must be wrong. So your body receives the message that <laughs> you're literally poisoned. 
Well, it makes that assumption because, well, it's not feeling anything. Or you're sort of poisoned by these this this mis miscommunication with your yeah. It's sort of functioning like a, some kind of drug, I suppose. And it's one of those things where people have a hard time putting that together, but it's really cool and it's going to make people puke. And I can tell you why. I had a 30 minute discussion with a professor of uh, <sighs> neurophysics at UCLA who was working specifically in VR. He was doing stuff with rats of all things. Oh, I like him already. Oh, well, no, he was actually had electrodes in and he were tracking things and seeing how it responded and thought and what was you are there and what wasn't. And, and we talked about this and he said, that's a really good way of describing it. It's a zero divider. It's expecting input. It's not getting it. Hence why people get sick. So you don't do things that people expect to get feedback on. Star Blood Arena, we worked at that significantly because when we originally pitched that to Sony, almost every other studio de- doing VR said it was impossible. It's a vomit factory. You can't make it. It's like, I did it back in the mid-90s and I learned a lot from it. You know, and all of us are applying it to take that into account. Um, and here's where I was going with all of this. When we, they did, you know, the big Sony events that they do every year and bring people together. I had over 800 people cycle through the game, playing it, random people off the streets. I had a 0.15% negative response rate. Wow, it was a 30% before now it's down to 1. 0. 0.15. 0. 0.15. Oh, okay. <laughs> Problem solved. Well, the thing is, we applied everything we'd learned. And it was one of the things where we were helping out other teams at Sony and like, can't we do it a little bit? And it's like, no, stop it. This is why you're having negative responses. You think it's cool, but you can't do it. The body doesn't like it. Just stop doing it you think you're being clever by doing it a tiny amount that makes it kind of worse because it's one of those things on the edge oh yeah you know and it's just no don't stop i think won't make you puke is a great <laughs> marketing <laughs> yeah well no you don't want to say that in the first place because oh, it's yeah. bad enough no oh, vr is going to make you sick no not if it's done right yeah, the thing is i've got problem. even remember the virtual boy people be like that'll give you a headache if you play oh it. that was a frame rate issue and interlace i don't know if you know that that was an interlaced 60 hertz for, uh display and interlace 60 hertz did not play well with a lot of people. Hmm. That's when they went progressive scan with monitors. Things that got better for a lot of people working on computers, period, because they got rid of the interlace. Yeah. I'm it not- flickers. You don't realize it. And different people react to that flicker. Hence, bad headaches with Virtual Boy. Yeah, there's that. I remember getting some better monitors or better monitor back in the day and it was like a i think like 100 hertz and something like that instead of whatever it was <laughs> i forget 60 the hertz interlace i just remember when i switched to the, you. when i switched it to the higher mode i'm whoa it's just like <laughs> a veil has been lifted or something <laughs> yep this is much better wow i'm never going back to that other thing sorry hardware and the physics of stuff gets back to my history. Here's the trick. I'm actually a physicist by education. Oh, yeah, we need it. We, I don't think, think we even talk really about your... <laughs> but the thing is... I, I got started, into all this. So you're a physicist by training. That but sense. I started programming back in the 70s because my dad built a computer. I think I heard you say your dad was uh, working for IBM Systems or... Federal Systems. Federal today. Systems. So, you're, you know, you've got some... Uh, I guess a lot of uh, connections to the 
computers and it's just been part of my life you've been part of your your three years after my dad built his i built my own based on an 8085 cool wrote my own version of tiny basic and then promptly had to reprogram it again because my dad didn't like my error messages (laughs) what's your error message (laughs) well here here's my problem i hate syntax error I just hate it. I don't know why. Anybody who loves them. (laughs) I made mine for when there was a problem with code in the line. Bullshit. Line number. That's what it came up with. He's like, (laughs) your age? No. Crap. So I had to re-enter everything in 8085 machine language and burn the ROMs. Well, that's a, must have been a good good time working with with dad on <laughs> building computers. I mean, how cool! And this was probably what the you late seventies. Oh wow, so really early. What was your first? Uh, did you get an Apple II? What was your first? Uh, My first real computer outside of our home builds. Yeah, sure. Okay, come on. My dad worked for IBM. <laughs> It was a PC. Yeah, the IBM. Well, you never know. You maybe wanted to see what the competition was up to. Or... No. The thing is, everybody's stuff was expensive back then. And I got the PC because my dad got it at a big discount because he worked for IBM. That's that's cool. And God help me. I had one of those 5150 keyboards. The ones where you could beat somebody to death in self-defense because it weighed five pounds and it was like solid metal. I still got one of those. That's a great. Yeah, that you know, I did the tried to adjust for inflation many years ago. It's probably more now, but I seem to recall one of those PCs back then would cost something like ten thousand dollars. Actually, I want to say it was more around five. Five. Yeah. But still very expensive back then. $5,000 was a car. Yeah, but I think you had a hard drive, right, for that? No. No hard drives? You're thinking about the expansion gauge with the 10 megabyte hard drive. Yeah, there you Five go. and a quarter inch, full height. Yeah, I didn't have one of those. <laughs> well, you studied oh, yeah, physics, though. I guess what drew you to that? I always enjoyed it the way my dad was treated at the end of his career really drove me away from computing because IBM was going through major changes and if this is how they treat somebody that's been loyal for 35 years they pushed everybody in my dad's group into retirement or to really screw with people to make sure they didn't work anywhere else medical retirement because that way nobody would touch them what the hell new management uh this is about the time when all of a sudden that the ivy league mbas were the thing to have as your managers uh i will say the person who did all that shit did get karma because he did not look at the contracts that my dad was a key player on. He was specifically called out to be working on these projects. And did not notify clients they were making these changes and brought in these young kids from college that I could get two for the price of him. So it's all good. You don't do that with the DOD. Mm. Karma was a serious bitch to IBM and to him. Remember in the late 80s, they lost like a half billion dollars in contracts? That's why. I just remember the PC Junior. Oh, with the chiclet keyboard. <laughs> yeah. 
probably not the best idea. I guess it, and then of course the whole thing with MS DOS or you know making that a letting Bill Gates. Yeah, uh, he just got a, build a whole empire on. <laughs> that, he just uh, got blessed by the wand of IBM, and that was it. Yeah. Well, let's see what else. I don't. I want to be mindful of your time. You doing okay? You got time for a few more? Yeah. Well, let's see. We've talked about. We haven't talked about run like hell. You get to work with Kate Mulgrew. I mean, the VO crew is fantastic. The game kind of is a problem for me because I got promoted out and somebody else was put in charge. Oh. And they turn it into a shooter. Basically, here's the best way of putting it. Run Like Hell initially was fundamentally what Alien Isolation did. But I had the concept in 2000. Or 99. And then it got radically changed because who was put in charge didn't get it and made it into something safe. Uh, but Kate Mulgrew that you called out yeah, is one of the most amazing VO actors I've ever worked with. Yeah, somewhere here. They, yeah, she boy. actually did most things on first take. Dr. Mech. Yes. And if she the funny part is we didn't like it. She didn't like it. And she's like, no, I don't like this. I'm going to do it again and get it on the second take. Did not need to direct her. It was flipping amazing. Wow. Yeah, I always really liked her. Sounds like she was great to work with. Well, the thing is, everybody, for the most part, that I worked with on there were fun. Mm-hmm. Lance was fun. Um. Clancy was great to work with because we initially made him into a gamer when he worked on Fallout. Because he was the voice of the master in Fallout, but he wanted to get into the game in the game context of his performance. Therefore, he played all the way through the end of the game and realized, you guys are doing neat stuff. And became a gamer. Hardcore. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and the dedication. I mean, it's, you know, a lot of stuff like that. That's well, too bad that didn't pan out, I guess. Well, I still have the initial story, the universe. I mean, I went full blown. Yeah, it's got you credited as the creator of the universe. Oh, uh, I went full spl- full blown classic writer on it in terms of I got a lot of stuff in my head. I've got 300 years history before the game. Um, just yeah, one day it may show up again. I bet you're great just as written. You must be great at writing the stuff with your. I mean the physics background. We, it's just, even I in, like, try you know, not to go hard. So many things that are that are just so wrong with, you know. I try not to go too hard sci-fi because that drives a lot of people away. You can make decent sci-fi and decent projection sci-fi with the knowledge. I mean, you want somebody who does that really well, Travis Taylor. Mm -hmm. Um, he's done some really good stuff teaming up with John Ringo where it was hard enough sci-fi that it's like okay this works but it was also enough that it wasn't like over the heads of most people that's the trick with sci-fi when you start getting into real physics is not to go over the head of the majority of the public yeah, I read a book. I'm trying to think of the name of the author, but it was like science or physics for science fiction authors. Uh, I think I want to say Ben Bova, maybe. I don't know. 
David Bryn. Um, don't they may be. It's just been too long, but but yeah, that was a real eye opener for me. <laughs> you know, it's a, like wow. There's, I mean, I knew the basic stuff. Like, there's no sound and in in a vacuum and all that, but there's just a lot. And you sometimes think maybe the Hollywood has done more to miseducate. <laughs> <laughs> come on they do things because it's cool and that's all they care about you don't get a lot of hard physics i mean where you started seeing them try to do real science the martian mm -hmm. where they started grounding it in reality and it's like okay i appreciate that you see i'm the kind of guy i appreciate stuff like that that's a big plus for me but the thing is you've got the knowledge to back it up a lot of people don't. You know, I've heard about a. I think it's Tom Cruise wants to film his next uh, movie in space. Like physically go there in the space station. Oh, <laughs> you not not a fan. <laughs> well, no, I think he's going to run into the shock of okay, they didn't pass physicals. You can't bring them. We're not going to be responsible killing people while launching him into space. That's what's going to catch him off guard. And that's what I'm shaking my head about is like, you don't realize the logistics problems you're setting yourself up for. You know, so, up until we get the space stock working where we can put anybody easily up in the space. Kind of a limiting factor. You know, those minor heart problems on Earth become big heart problems trying to go into zero G at 25,000 miles an hour. Uh, he'll just parachute down, right? And show up at a bar. <laughs> okay, you're just going to pull Yuri Gargan. Got it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. If, have you seen Maverick? That, yeah. Yeah, you well, know what I'm talking about then. That, yeah, no, sorry. I had to go to Yuri. How many G's he's supposed to be or mock, whatever, you know? Well, I mean, okay. Getting back to Buzz Aldrin's race in the space. <laughs> Did you know the first two landings uh, for the Soviet program? How they were handled? I don't know anything about that. Okay. Yuri kicked out the door and jumped out at about 12,000 feet. With a parachute from hmm. the capsule. And that's how we landed. Hmm. Which, considering how fast that capsule was moving, even at 12,000 feet, that took some serious damn guts. Yeah. I mean, it's, I'm trying to picture this. Hmm. Oh, hell. Um, their two seater and even their three seater, when they had them landing actually in the capsule. How they did it? Under the heat shield, they had explosives because they were landing on hard earth. They weren't landing in water. They detonated it to get enough of an air cushion so they didn't jellify when they hit the ground. Jeez. I mean, you have to have a serious appre appreciation for what Korolev did with the program with the limitations he had. That's just amazing. You know, it shows what people can do when they're just really determined. Well, he was determined and all the people he wanted, he wasn't allowed to have. He instead get party, party members in good standing as opposed to guys that were in gulags, but brilliant scientists. So he worked brilliantly with what he had. And it's amazing what he pulled off. I have serious respect for the man. I think politics were so bad in the Russian space program. Uh, the first Soyuz that they launched, three-man capsule, his deputy director underneath him went up in that program to show faith in Korolev. And here's the real kicker most people don't realize. The Soyuz, 
they don't go up in suit. There's not enough space. Huh. So if they lose pressure when they're launching, they're SOL. Man, these guys. I don't know. <laughs> Gives you a lot more appreciation working with this than yeah. how much cowboys they were. All right. Well, a wrap. Let's see. Well, we haven't talked about. Let me pause it for a second. Okay, so I had another fan question I want to run by you. <laughs> you bet. So his question, I don't know, maybe you'll be able to answer this. He's asking about Dungeon Master. Speaking of sequels, uh, Dungeon yeah. Master 2, Skull Keep. He says, just, I want to know as much as possible about FTL and Dungeon Master 3. Also, was Dungeon Master 2 really made for Japan first? And it, did it take several years to come to the West? So a couple of different questions in there, but all around that. No, it was made for the West right out the gate. Um, still took several years to get done. I don't know about Dungeon Master 3 and the crew after that. It was kind of a one-shot deal with Interplay when we did that. So... It was a challenging project, and some of the folks there and I did not have the best terms when we left because they wanted to make the game with a 16 bit palette still. And it's like, dude, you need to catch up with the times. This is what 93. 94, 94, 94, oh, wow. 94, 95, because this shipped after Descent. Hmm. And that didn't go over well. And, well, we might be plagiarizing from other games. And it's like, no, all those other games you're talking about plagiarized from you. Straight up. Yeah, the first and, Dungeon Master. I mean, that was the first I remember of that sort of fluid movement and Fluid movement, first person view. And yeah, speaking of audio, I mean that was one of the big selling points of that was put your headphones on and you're gonna be scared. There's <laughs> gonna be jump scared. And then all you heard, and crap, I just lost my weapon. You know, the thief. <laughs> um that's hilarious. They thought they were worried about oh know. yeah, and that got into big arguments like, dude, you're not plagiarizing anybody, everybody is plagiarizing you and each other. Yes, I mean, it's nobody just, can complain. Is it eye of the beholder? I mean, you're like, okay, yep. And those are the things we were talking about eye of the beholder, lands of lore. Yeah. Um, I mean, and, even down to like where the buttons are and stuff. Yeah. It's like you're not plagiarizing a damn person. You, you're being paranoid to your own destruction. Don't do this. Trust me. I'm not sure what this thing about Japan was there. Was there something? Well, Japan, here's the thing. Um, Japan has always been big on that and wizardry. Do you know there are multiple wizardry titles that only have come out on console in Japan? Yeah, I've seen some of those. I wish they would, somebody would translate those. Maybe it's, it's been a while since I looked. Have any of those been translated? Uh, not those, but they have brought a couple over to the States as an all-in-one package. You remember, I was kind of surprised one time I was doing some research on the, the class, you know, the Surtec wizardries. And like, wow, there's like four or five, you know, like all these other spinoffs and this whole little, you know, it's, it's like this epic thing. Yeah, it was, it's, it's a thing in Japan, straight up. I, they made a specific version of kind of two for console in Japan. They made another Dungeon Master that I want to say well, that was specifically for the TG-16 CD-ROM hmm. uh, version. Oh, but cool. that was for Japan only. Oh. <laughs> 
because they liked it in Japan. I mean, much bigger than the U.S. Yeah, I had one of my friends. I was, I ran it. You know, told him we were, I was going to interview you today, and he was. We got to talking about the ports, making ports of a game for different systems okay. and consoles. And he's like, you know, he just he and I, I share this opinion. But he's like, there is like that's an art, and a very good. You know, that's a skill and a talent. And it's easy to do badly, <laughs> yep. you know, and there's unique challenges and it's just totally un- underappreciated. Well, that was one of those things I fought with. Uh, Star Trek 25th anniversary was the first AGA chipset game for the Amiga. Oh, cool. for, some, for Interplay. Because the palace... I got an Amiga 4000 sitting back there. I should boot it up. The thing was, the pallets needed to make it work couldn't be done on 64 colors. Or 80. And, well, you couldn't make operate at a good enough speed ham mode. God help me. You know, so... I eventually went and made it our first AGA game because you want it. I can't do this. By the way, if we do it like this, we need a hard drive because otherwise they needed to have four disk drives attached for floppies and constantly swapping. (laughs) That's not good for a user experience. I'm going to make it hard drive only. I know it makes you angry, but this is reality. You know, Sorry, I can't do magic dust. Can't just make it magically go away. It's this or nothing. So, yeah, it was one of our last Amiga titles, and it was our first AGA. Did, did you have fun working on it? Or the AGA? Oh, yeah. Did, did you but, like, I guess I should say, did you like the, the Amiga? The Amiga has its own things I did enjoy about it. One of the things I did love to death was what you could do with audio um you can probably guess that i actually used to follow the tracking scene and did some of my own stuff and you could do some really neat things with the amiga with those four channels and tracking mm-hmm. you know the, the you work with the demo scene on uh linger in shadows right the polish uh, plastic i think yeah yeah, but that was. Yeah, I know. I love later. those. I still listen to Amiga mods all the time. There's a couple of YouTube channels that play those. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just love the sound of it. It's like to me, it's a musical instrument. Yeah, you could do something. Quite sounds stuff. like it, like it. I've interviewed a couple of the, uh, I guess, what do you call them, trackers? <laughs> yeah, they're a lot of fun. You know, again, they tend, at least the ones I've talked to, they're so humble about, you know, the stuff they've done. I'm like, I love it. Well, the thing is, because not a lot of people consider what they do really that much. And it's the whole demo scene for a moment. It's like, no, these guys are artists in their own right. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you look at all the different classes that you have of the kinds of demos that are being generated, they all do neat stuff. My God, uh, working with uh, Farb Roush. Oh, yeah, yeah, those are great. Oh, well, no, my favorite one that sold a lot of people on working with the scene uh, was Dot the Product. It was a 125K demo. Well, I set it up so I had multiple monitors so they could see the resources of what it was doing. And when it went from 125K to 400 megs of procedurally generated resources to make the whole thing work. Just, and it ran for five minutes with music and everything else. It's like, holy crap. It's like, no. These guys are incredibly talented programmers. Just nobody takes them seriously. 
because it's just that goofy thing hiding in the background. It's like, no, they do amazing work. I remember showing some of these to some classes I taught here, and I was trying to impress on them, like the, you know, the, the fact that it's 64 K, you know, like this is, I guess it's kind of hard to appreciate if you don't really know the what's you can't involved here. Really understand and appreciate. Um, yeah. It's like, okay, plastic didn't do the micro demos, but in turn, they had, and this was the thing that sold Shuhei because he appreciated what they were doing. They had 32 meta balls rendered through software at 30 frames a second, all interacting and mushing together. It's one of those things you have to see it, and it's like, oh, crap, they're doing what? <laughs> In conjunction, they're using hardware to do other stuff. This is all being done through software because it's all splines. Holy crap. I mean, these guys are really talented, and for whatever reason, they don't get recognition. Drives me nuts. What is that? It sounds like you've met, met several of them. They well, just I, not seek a career or, or they not want to work for the industry or. Well, the thing was, okay, there was no opportunity for Michael and plastic. It was me coming there going, Hey guys, you want to be paid money to make a demo? Wait, what you want to pay us? And yeah, we're talking about this and the money we're talking about was really good for Poland. So the leather rinse repeat. Um, <sighs> Sax Pearson, who was at Shiny and then eventually Microsoft, and has done a bunch of stuff for them. He came from the demo scene in Europe. Um, I mean, a few people make it over, but it's few and far between. As I said, I track the scene. I keep in touch with people there. Several organizers over the years have gotten in touch with me because it's like, you take us seriously. It's like, yeah, no. I remember when guys from CNCD were doing uh, software rendering that was doing proper video feedback. In terms of Cameras aiming down a mirror and having the full, you know, wait a minute, going on to infinity, looking back and forth against each other. Yeah, these guys were doing it in 1994. <laughs> this is incredible. Software rendering and still maintaining a decent frame rate. It's like just the mindset that is being ignored because people don't take them seriously oh it's a little niche thing it's like no we can learn a lot from them i'm sort of interested in it i mean actually where do you think 3 mark 3d mark came from oh demo scene. or x demo scene <laughs> 3D I mean, mark I is x demo scene people you know i remember growing up and i was kind of curious what you thought about the uh you know the sort of crack true scene and the, like the and the <laughs> that that sort of uh, side of it well that's what led to the demo scene were the crack rows. yeah and yeah no i appreciate as a publisher but... Mac, you're like oh my god i can't believe I'm, i hate these guys they they rip the rip ripped off our game here I mean, okay do... problem is most of us went legit and yes i include myself in there if you see anything for the Apple II that was cracked by Lord Ariok. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> well, you wouldn't the believe the number you. of people I could list off who have been in the games industry forever that all came from that scene. I got to uh, meet Captain Crunch one time. All right. And that was back in, uh, I think he was in Columbia. And, but, but I mean, the, what I was thinking of though was just, you know, I know you have this 
you know, this this love of art and the sort of artistic side of the, these things and creative expression and all that. And I think these demos are really where, you know, if you want to talk about computers and, and art and, you know, do, really just doing crazy things with the medium, you know, if you look at uh, like the history of film and cinema, you know, you had this that same sort of impulse. Let's just do, <laughs> I'm going to do incredible things that probably only other you know, cinema experts can appreciate what what I achieved here with this, but I mean, nevertheless, it's. And, I mean, hell, Salvador Dali did more random stuff in early film that had a lot of importance, and people don't realize it. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you know optical dissolves were created by him? I did not know. <laughs> I probably should know because we have a we had a Dali museum there or gallery there in Tampa. Um, or was it anyway somewhere around sorry there. big fan of dolly and all the things that he did and the trick is all the things that. where you start really realizing it's like okay damn yeah well i think do we want to end it there yeah, I, I'll be honest. I really do have to jump out here. I need to force yeah, myself to eat something. Well, hey, uh, Rust, um, I really appreciate this. This has been awesome. Uh, no worries. I'm really going to enjoy this. I appreciate you taking some time. I'll let you know when I get the video up. Okay. Hopefully I wasn't that too far all over the place, which is unfortunately something I do. No, it's great. I really enjoyed talking to you. I hope you enjoyed it too. Yeah. Okay. Well, unless you get something to eat, that sounds pretty good to me too. Yeah. Well, my problem is I have to look at time and remember. Um, actually, you don't know. And this is something I just went out with mainly the industry people. Uh, I found out two weeks ago, I have myeloma, which has been screwing with me, with my kidneys. Mm. I have aplastic anemia and I don't want to eat. Mm. So when I say force myself to eat, it is literally forcing myself to eat. only good thing is randomly moving out here found me three hours away from one of the best cancer wards in the nation so yeah i saw you were you know i saw some stuff you had posted on twitter and facebook it sounds seems like you had some some people come to, you know help yeah that was yeah. good I have yeah. had some people show up and it's actually been very surprising. Yeah. <sighs> Tough time. Well, I mean, the thing that amazes me is one company reached out and I have a lifetime top platinum health plan now. Well, that's 100% awesome. taken care of by them. That's great. Yeah, so anything else I raised, be honest, it's for out-of-pocket and deductible and any orphan drugs that they're going to say, oh, no, this is orphan. We don't care if you need it to live. Have a nice day. Hmm. So, yeah. All right, I'm going to jump out here. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, have a good night. I wish you all the best, Rusty. All right. And that's all for this week's episode. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed that. And of course, uh, you know, all the best wishes, possible thoughts and prayers uh, for Rusty and his uh, family, his loved ones. I hope, you know, that goes okay, obviously. You know, I know it's a challenging time. Uh, on a positive note, though, he did get some... You know, I am glad that he was able to get the health coverage and, and get moved uh, successfully. So, you know, again, best wishes to him uh, during this challenging time. Uh, as always, I want to thank you very, very much for supporting the show, for helping me 
you know, collect these stories from people like Rusty and, and Steve and you know, all the people we've been talking to. Of course, another thank you to uh, Sue for helping me find these, uh, uh, find and arrange these interviews. I mean, these are some great stories. I think we can all agree it's good to have these on YouTube, have these preserved uh, for future generations. <laughs> you know, you never know what, where these might end up, what service they uh, might perform someday. Uh, so anyway, thank you for making it happen. And if you, for whatever reason, have been on the sidelines uh, thinking about that patron, <laughs> do I really want to become a Ratron? Do I really want to give this Matt Barton guy a buck of show? You know you want to. <laughs> Slide in there. <laughs> Go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon page. Takes a couple of minutes to set that up. Hey, you're going to like the show a lot better. You get on that kick-ass discord channel you're gonna have a good time you're not gonna regret it so uh just go ahead and take my word uh you know and of course the books are still for sale you know not, i should probably pimp these books a little bit more you know I, i'm an author <laughs> yeah i love this cover on dungeons and desktops my good friend robbie painted this i mean what a great artist great friend he, he did the matt chat coin as well he's a good musician plays guitar you know, I should get him on our Discord Shreds channel. I'll play on that guitar. He's got a... If you ever watch Spinal Tap, you know that scene where Nigel uh, has all the guitars and the, the cameraman comes in there and he's like, uh, you know, he's trying to like pan around and look at the collection and Nigel runs over and he's like, oh, no, 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 I don't even want this one filmed. <laughs> you know, I get the impression that's how uh, Robbie is with his guitar collections. I don't know. I'm just, you know, kidding. Uh, but anyway, where was I uh, with this? Uh, I think I was thanking you. Uh, well, what about that news from the Matt Cave? All right, got some great stuff here as always. Good old Miko, 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 Miko. Right, said about the Master of Magic. You might remember that game from back in the day, 1994. Well, I was just really, I graduated high school in 95, so <laughs> uh, they call this a 4X strategy game. You know, I can never remember what the hell that 4X means. Four times? You know, it's just, a, I probably should know that. <laughs> this will be on the quiz. Uh, anyway, it's a good game. Uh, it looked, but anyway, the news is they're about to release a, an updated sort of remake of it, I guess you'd call this. Uh, it's extent there's an extensive q a on the website like i mean it goes on and on. you really learn everything you want to know about this remake folks uh, to me it looks really good really excited about this uh, the original was done by simtex and published by microprose let's see the i got the date here yes december 13th so not too long you might want to go ahead and pre-order that if that's possible not sure what the price is you know to tell you the truth my notes are kind of lame <laughs> Oh, but you can check out that Q&A if you want to learn more. That is, again, Master of Magic. And then Tired Gaming Dad wrote in about this game, Signalis. Signalis? Signalis? You know, it sounds kind of like a medicine. <laughs> Ask your doctor about Signalis. Uh, anyway, it's not a medicine. Or maybe it is. I don't know. Uh, it's coming out. Uh, it just re released on October 27th, so just recent. A classic survival horror game. Experience set in a dystopian pharmaceutical and not a dystopian future where humanity has uncovered a dark secret. Oh, those are the best kind of secrets, aren't they? Unravel a cosmic mystery, escape terrifying creatures, escape an off world government facility as Elster, a technician replica, searching for her lost dreams. This is about 20 bucks on Steam, 19.99. You know, they always do that, like just throw the extra penny in there. And I've actually heard there's something like weird psychological thing where people will buy something for $19.99, but if it's $20, they will say, no, that's too expensive. It's a penny! It's a penny! <laughs> people are nuts, aren't they? People are crazy. Uh, anyway, uh, let's see. Oh, I, I wanted to uh, quote a little bit of a review of this game on Steam. This is a UC Grabs review of uh, Signalis. He says... Uh, he or she, I'm not sure, they, <laughs> who knows. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the great, great review goes something like this. Do you like the first Resident Evil? You know, I think most people do. Do you like Silent Hill Hospitals? Do you like Blade Runner? 
Do you like being in a train contemplating your life in the middle of a psychotic breakdown? Eh, I don't know about that one. Uh, get this. <laughs> get this now. <laughs> uh, so there you go. Thank you for that. You see, grand. And then finally, our old friend Shane plays. <laughs> yes, yeah, the one and only Mr. Shane Stacks. What a guy. What a guy. Writes in about this, 11-Bit Studios, the complete collection Humble Bundle. Yes, the old Humble Bundle. <laughs> this one has nine games in it, including uh, Frostpunk, so probably worth it just for that. Uh, this War of Mine, probably worth it just for that. And then Children of Morta, Spacecom, and a whole bunch of other stuff. They recommend, or suggest, I guess, 25 bucks, but, you know, you could pay what you want. You could be cheap and just give them a buck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or you could give more and get on some kind of leaderboards. I don't know how it all works. You know, the thing about these are uh, the money goes to charity. I mean, it's always like to think about that. And you can read about the charities. They do different ones. You know, sometimes they'll let you pick the charity. I don't know if that's the way it is with this. Uh, but anyway, it's probably worth 25 bucks, you know, just to get all, the, all this stuff. All right, let's wrap it up with a quote. Um, and the quote is from Mr. Andy Warhol. Well, that's pretty good art. <laughs> you know, I only like him because he did the uh, uh, a lot of stuff for the on the Amiga computer, which I always thought was pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, anyway, I like this quote, and I think I can relate to it. Maybe you can too. It goes something like this: Don't pay any attention to what they write about you; just measure it in inches. <laughs> good old Andy Warhol. Anyway, hope you folks enjoy that. And See you next time. I know engineers, they love to change.